Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We hope that you, your families, and friends are healthy and safe. Welcome to the AI for Good webinar, and we are so happy you came to join us. Today, we are going to discuss about how to develop accountable AI solutions. My name is Gino Om from the ITU, International Telecommunications Union, which is the UN specialized agency for information and communication technologies. I'm joining today from Geneva, and I have the privilege of introducing today's webinar. IQ is the organizer of AI for Good Global Summit, alongside with XPRIZE, in partnership with the 36 UN agencies, ACM, and co convener Switzerland. The goal of the AI for Good Summit is to identify practical applications of AI that can help achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And this year, the AI for Good Summit 2020 is taking place throughout the year, always online. We are publishing weekly webinars, solution tracks, and keynotes that will allow us to reach even more people throughout the year. Today, we have a very distinguished panel featuring Amy van Weinsberg, Jan Kleisen, and the discussion will be co-facilitated by Fritz Busmacher and Arthur van der Bies. The panelists will present their remarks, but we are in particular counting on participants to help create an engaging discussion. So for this, We'll be using the Q&A functionality, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. You can also upload questions that were posed by others, which you'd like the facilitator to ask the panel. Additionally, there's the chat functionality, which you can use to have discussions with all other participants. And please make sure the message recipient is sent to everyone and not just to panelists. So before we turn towards our panel, I'd like to ask everyone to use the chat functionality and test us, uh, let us know where you're connecting from. So which country or city? So please just type it into the chat and make sure you send it to everyone. We'll be able to have an idea of uh, who is in the room from different places. So let me start by typing Geneva, Switzerland, myself, and I can see Milano, Berlin, UK, Armenia, New Jersey, India, Albania, Netherlands, Ottawa, Canada, Korea, Hague, Amsterdam, Estonia, Kenya. Wow, this is great. So I think we have very diverse participation connecting from all over the world. So that is very excellent. Now I'm very much looking forward to engaging discussion with this diversity of our perspectives. And with that, I think now is the time for me to hand it over to our facilitator, Fritz. Hello, Fritz, are you ready? Jenu, thank you very much for that introduction and also a warm welcome from my side. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, looking at the list, we have over four or five countries, uh, continents present in our call today. So very happy with that. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to welcome our speakers and our, my co-moderator. And I would like to thank the ITU for this opportunity uh, to speak on accountability. A uh, quick introduction, uh, Fritz Bussemaker. I'm the co-founder and chair of the Institute for Accountability in the Digital Age, and also the deputy chair of the Outreach Commission for the AI for Good Global Summit. So the topic today is how to develop accountable AI solutions. And we have two panel members for we will make some opening remarks. First of all, Amy van Weinsbergen. She's an assistant professor in ethics and robotics at the Technical University in Delft, and she will present on the role of data ethics. And secondly, we have Jan Kleiser, Director of Information Society Action Against Crime, part of Council of Europe, which will take us um, on the Council of Europe's approach to establish a legal framework for AI. And Arthur van der Wees will also be joining us as a co-founder of the Institute and will be a co-moderator. So the agenda will be that we first have two presentations uh, of about 10, 15 minutes each. And afterwards we'll have a discussion moderated by Arthur van der Wees with uh, the two speakers and hopefully also with a number of uh, questions you have uh, brought us in the chat. So to give you a little bit of uh, context, uh, the Institute for Accountability in the Digital Age. Uh, first of all, this was set up in 2017, instigated by the late Dr. Inderit Banayi. He was the director of Knowledge Societies at UNESCO, and he saw a growing concern uh, about the gap between the fast developing digital technology 
and the legal and regulatory framework. Now, this is not just about AI, this is also about social media, cybersecurity. And because of that concern or that gap, uh, we, in, we set up this institute to help address uh, how we can uh, bridge that gap by stimulating a global and multi-stakeholder discussion. Now, I have to make very clear, we do not own the discussion on accountability, but we want to act as a catalyst. So also this webinar is part of that ambition, that desire to have a global discussion, how we're going to deal with accountability. And just for your information, uh, the picture behind me is of the Peace Palace in The Hague. Uh, the Institute is based in the city of The Hague and is one of the four UN uh, cities. Now to link, make a link to AI for good, when we started in 2017, um, look, we had the very first event at the office of the ITU. Um, for me, it was very much about awareness creation. What does AI have to offer? Immediately in the second year, we saw uh, showcasing great examples what artificial intelligence can do. And it was actually only in the last year that we saw the first mentions of the need for accountability in a couple of the keynote speakers. And we realized that we need to have, we, we want to develop AI for good. So we need to make certain that those systems are indeed doing what they're supposed to do. And if not, who are you going to call? Uh, and accountability in itself is not an end goal. It's a fundamental prerequisite, just like transparency, privacy, and security. So we're now continuing that debate. We started in 2015 with this online uh, event. And um, actually right now, uh, I would like to invite Amy van Weinsbergen to zoom in on her views on how data ethics plays a role. This will be a 10 minute discussion and then we'll get back to the next uh, speaker. So Amy, welcome uh, that you uh, to this uh, webinar and uh, very interested to uh, hear what you have to share uh, with the audience. Thank you. Thanks, Fritz, for the warm invitation and welcome. Uh, thank you to ITU for hosting this event and to my panelist, Jan Kleisen. I'm really looking forward to engaging in this discussion with you. Um, so what I'm going to do in my 10 minutes is try to unpack this concept of accountability as it relates to artificial intelligence. And I want to address three kind of key questions. Who? is accountable, who are we talking about when we're saying uh, accountability? What are they accountable for? And why is this so important? Um, I should also indicate that uh, I am, as Fritz mentioned, I'm an associate professor at the Technical University of Delft here in the Netherlands. And I explore the area of ethics and robotics and artificial intelligence. And really my work is about uh, taking the, the abstract concepts from ethics and translating those into something that's very useful and usable for other academic disciplines. At the same time, I am also involved in civil society organizations, policy making groups. I'm a member of the European Commission High Level Expert Group on AI. And I also have a role in industry. I'm a, a fellow at the Deloitte Center for the Edge. So the reason why I share these different roles is to also explain that um, while I'm giving my talk, I'm trying to take insights from all of these different places and engage them in one sort of line or, or thread of communication. So getting into my talk, accountability, first of all, who are we talking about, right? I think it's important for us to remember that, you know, sometimes when we hear these phrases like responsible AI or trustworthy AI or accountable AI, sometimes we have the tendency to think that the technology itself should be responsible or trustworthy or accountable for something. But I think it's really important that we recognize and understand that it should be the humans who are accountable for the decisions that are made in the design, the development, the deployment, and the use of artificial intelligence. Okay, so the, the first thing that I want to put on the table is that we're talking about humans being accountable for the creation, the deployment, and the use of this technology. And the second thing is that it's not just humans who are accountable in terms of how we develop the technology, that is very important, but that's one stage in the life cycle of the technology. Really, we need to be thinking about accountability on this broader scale, right? So at every moment in the life cycle of the development, the deployment, and the use of the technology, there are different things that need to be considered, and there needs to be individuals or teams who take ownership for accountability along these different life cycles. 
Now, the next question that I want to address is what? What are the humans actually accountable for? Of course, there's a variety of different themes or ways that, that one could address this, right? Cybersecurity, sustainability, it's a variety of different areas that you could approach this through. I am putting on the table ethics, right? That we need the humans to be accountable for anticipating ethical risks, for uncovering what those risks actually are or could be, for trying to make sense of those ethical risks, and then for mitigating or preventing those ethical risks. So the humans are responsible for what? For understanding and preventing ethical risks, again, throughout the entire life cycle of the development of artificial intelligence. Now, uh, just briefly touching on the why, why is this important? Why am I putting this on the table? I'm suggesting that, that ethics, paying attention to ethics and the risks to societal values and, and, and societal ethics in general, that if we can establish procedures and, and systems to, to actually have organizations thinking about these considerations throughout the multiple life cycles of the technology, this is how we begin to establish trust, right? This is how we begin to establish trust in the systems that are put in place to create the technology and the people who are making, deploying and using this technology. So that's sort of, you know, in, in a nutshell what I'm talking about. But of course, it's important for me to also answer the question, what is ethics? Right? What, what do I mean when I'm talking about ethics? The first thing that I want to say there is that, you know, we see now around the world, there's over 130 different uh, AI ethics guidelines or AI ethics principles. And this is a wonderful start. But it's important to know that ethics is not just principles. It's not just guidelines. It's so much more than that. It's really a continual reflection on what is going on when we introduce a technology into society. Okay. So now sometimes some people that, that you can, can talk to about the field of ethics, they might say, well, ethics is about what it means to be a good person, right? What are the, the virtues or the characteristics of an individual that we can say, yes, this is a good person. Other people might say that, no, ethics is more about a theory of right action. What does it mean to be able to say that an action is right or wrong or good or bad? And all of these are true, of course, but I think what's helpful for this conversation is to, to have a larger perspective of ethics. And this is an older Aristotelian view of ethics. And that is, we should really think of ethics as the study of the good life, what it is and how we can achieve it. And we use the language of values to be able to talk about the components of the good life. So values like sustainability, values like safety, security, privacy, well-being, these are the components of the good life, right? And so ethics is constantly looking at what are new components of the good life? Uh, how are these components within a society actually being realized? How are they being threatened? So ethics, the study of the good life, what it is and how we can achieve it, and then we have the introduction of technology. And it's very important because technology can actually change the way we think about the good life. It can, it can help us to realize the good life, right? It can help us to somewhat be connected with people right now as, as we are right now. Technology is helping to facilitate this, but it can also threaten components of the good life. It can make us feel insecure about our privacy when we're sharing data or when we're sharing information in this hyper digital space. So then the ethics of artificial intelligence is really looking at how does the design, development, the deployment and the use of this technology actually impact the ability to realize the good life or how does it change what the good life looks like in the end, okay? So um, what I'm suggesting then is when we're talking about, you know, humans being accountable for including ethics in the multiple design phases of artificial intelligence is that we need to start thinking about ethics as a resource, ethics as a tool that can help us create better technology. And what I mean when I say that ethics is a resource is that really the field, the entire domain of ethics is looking at how do we uncover risks to ethical values, right? Ethical values that might be impacted negatively or positively, and how do we promote the technologies that really help to, to foster the, the different values? So it's about uncovering values, but it's also about understanding those values. 
what does the value mean in today's world? And I think an, an interesting example to think about this is privacy, the value of privacy, and how we see that the meaning of privacy has changed over time. That some people might say privacy is dead, but it's not that privacy is dead, it's just that we understand it in a different way. So if you take healthcare as an example, privacy decades ago was really about uh, keeping your body private, you know, having control over the fact that no one could see your body if you were in a hospital room. You have a curtain to enclose around the, the patient's bed so that you have some privacy. Nobody else is looking at you. But now jump forward to today. And really, when people say privacy in the healthcare context, they're thinking about control over their health data. They're thinking about, do I have control over who has it, uh, when it's shared, who else is allowed to see it and to use it? So privacy has not gone anywhere. It's just that it's changed in its meaning. And that's really important for us to understand because when you say that there's a threat to privacy, you need to know what kind of a threat you're talking about. And the reason why you need to know what kind of a threat you're talking about is because only when you know this can you do something to prevent that threat or to mitigate that threat threat. So now, of course, I, I'm talking about ethics and I'm saying that this is something we should be including as a way of, of enhancing or establishing accountability in the procedures that we use to create this technology. But I should also be clear that I'm not saying it's ethics or policy, ethics or regulation. No, no, no. Of course, we need both. We need to have the two together. But what I am saying or suggesting is that ethics is actually a way for us to understand what kind of policy we need. What are the values that are being threatened that we need policy in order to prevent those threats, in order to create a level playing ground that every company or, or organization must abide by. So it's not an, uh, an either or, it's definitely a both, but I'm suggesting that ethics actually helps us to get to appropriate policy for this kind of technology. Not only that, but if we also start to embed ethics into organizations, we get to understand how the technology evolves and impacts our, our values and our conceptions of values over time. So it's one thing for us to understand that right now, there are certain ethical issues related to artificial intelligence, mostly around, you know, if we're talking about machine learning, it's the black box of the algorithm, who is responsible if we don't understand the rules that the model has actually generated. But two years from now, we might have different ethical risks that need to be taken into consideration in policy. And it's the job of ethics when it's allowed to accompany the development, the design, the deployment of the technology to be able to uncover and, and make sense of these new evolving ethical issues. And that way we can inform the continuous development of appropriate policy to protect citizens, consumers, and, and society in general. So with that then, my suggestion, again, going back to who, what, or why are we talking about this? I address industry at this point, right? So the, the particular who that I'm talking to are the developers of artificial intelligence, the deployers of artificial intelligence, and oftentimes the users of artificial intelligence. So this could be uh, you know, private industry, but also we're seeing uh, public services using AI more and more. So as users, they should be thinking about this as well. But my suggestion to really be able to embed ethics or to, to have ethics accompany the design process is to think about it in three different sort of aspects. We can use ethics to inspire technical solutions, right? To create interfaces so that people understand where their data is going and how it's being used to, to train or to actually uh, feed into an algorithm. We can use ethics to help establish appropriate governance mechanisms, right? So if we want to have ethics embedded into an organization, we need to establish ownership. This is how we achieve accountability, right? Is there an individual or a team of individuals in an organization that are taking ownership for uh, data ethics, digital ethics, or the ethics of artificial intelligence that's happening? And I mean, having you know, a team in place to create principles that a company can use as their sort of North Star or, or to guide them, but it's not just about principles, right? It's about also putting procedures in place to make sure that all of the actions that are taken within a company actually make sense. They, they map onto the principles that have already been established. But the third way that I suggest that ethics can really be used as a resource is to start thinking about embedding ethicists on design teams. 
So within an organization, you'll have a, a small group of individuals who are working to create a new uh, artificial intelligence model or, or who are using a model and, and using it for new applications. And I suggest that we include ethicists on these teams. And, and the reason for this is because we usually have legal expertise, we have marketing expertise, we have computer scientists, graphic designers sometimes, and we need to now start to think about ethics or, or ethicists as, as being another skill that is added to the team that helps us to think about the unintended consequences, to, to think about what values could be impacted, what this means, so that we can start mitigating and preventing at the very early stages of design and development. So when you take these three together, that you have technical solutions, governance solutions, and co-development as a way of really embracing ethics as a resource, you begin to, to harness ethics within a company. And this is really how you start to facilitate that trust in a company, that the company is doing something, not just saying, yes, we have ethics principles, but are really doing something to show that they're putting processes in place to manifest, to realize these principles, they're creating technical solutions, and they're making sure that ethics becomes embedded into the very fabric of the organizations. So another point that I wanted to make is that ethics is not the same as compliance, right? When you have a policy, when you have regulation, then you're talking about compliance. But it's really important to understand that, that ethics is voluntary. It's, you're, you're not doing uh, ethics, AI ethics within an organization because you've told, been told that you have to do that. You're doing that because you believe it is the right thing to do for citizens and for society. And so if companies really want to show their commitment to establishing and or maintaining trust in this space, they need to act before regulation requires that they act. And I think, you know, uh, artificial intelligence for the SDGs is a really great example to, to, to showcase or to, to, to make this uh, real. That companies are not obliged, this is not something that legally is demanded of them, but when they do this, when, when they say that they have a vested interest in creating their products to achieve the sustainable development goals, this is going a step further. This is really showing a commitment to being accountable for the achievement of the sustainable development goals. And then I should also say, let's take sustainability as a value though, right? Uncovering uh, what it means and, and why it's so important. And, and we, it's important for us to understand that AI for the SDGs is different from sustainable AI. And we also really need companies and organizations to be thinking about how they can create AI in a sustainable manner. So using ethics to inspire new kinds of innovation, whether it's reusable data sets, minimizing their computational power as much as possible for the training of algorithms, but using this value of ethics to actually inspire new kinds of innovation. So to close, uh, what I was trying to do is to unpack this concept of accountability when it comes to artificial intelligence by addressing specifically the who, the what, and the why. Why is this so important? Who is Who needs to be accountable and what is it that they're accountable for? So I'm suggesting that accountable AI is directed at the human stakeholders who are involved in the entire life cycle of AI, so design, development, deployment, and use. And that one aspect or one way of kind of painting the picture, one thing that humans need to be responsible for is the inclusion, the incorporation of ethical reflection throughout the entire life cycle of the development of these pro uh, products. And so when we can think of ethics in this way, that it's actually a contribution to better design, this really uh, shows a new kind of face to ethics, yeah? That it's not stifling innovation, that it's not a hindrance to innovation, that it's really something that is me meant to um, harness AI innovation while at the same time making sure that we protect citizens and we create better products, better for people and for planet. So thank you, that's me. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what Jan Kleisen has to say. Hey, Amy, thank you very much. You have given us a passionate presentation on things to consider and uh, it uh, definitely raised a number of questions in the chat and in the Q&A. So um, Arthur and I will have a look at that and see how we're going to cover all those questions as much as possible, at least uh, when we have our um, discussion afterwards. So uh, thank you uh, again. And it's now my honor and pleasure to introduce Jan Kleisen. 
Jan is the Director of Information Society and also responsible action against crime at the Council of Europe. And Jan uh, will take us uh, along um, with the Council of Europe's uh, efforts to establish a legal framework for artificial intelligence. Jan, uh, first of all, very thank uh, th I want to thank you very much for uh, your time and sharing your thoughts and uh, information. I also assume you will say a couple of words on the Council of Europe for those people overseas who are not familiar with the Council of Europe. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Fritz. I hope you can all hear me. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, very many thanks to, to my good friend Amy for a brilliant presentation on the, the question of ethics. And of course, to our colleagues uh, from the ITU for hosting this, this, this webinar. As I speak to you, I realize many of you are still very much uh, under the suffering from the consequences of the pandemic. I hope, of course, first of all, that you're all safe and that your loved ones are safe. But I realize uh, very strict restrictions still apply in many parts of the world. I'm speaking to you from Strasbourg, which is in France, uh, where there has been a slight loosening of, of the, of the, of the lockdown. Well, the lockdown is over. There's still measures in place. Uh, but unfortunately, in the recent days, the number of cases has increased again. So uh, we all very much worried about the, about the situation. And um, before I say a word about the Council of Europe, uh, let me say a few words on, on COVID and artificial intelligence, because many of us hoped that uh, AI would somehow be a silver bullet, uh, a magical wand that would help us find a very rapid solution to this nasty virus. Um, so far, it hasn't. It has certainly helped. It helped in research, in sharing research, uh, in bringing scientists together. We had hoped it would perhaps bring governments more together as well, although intergovernmental cooperation seems to be lagging very much behind scientific cooperation. Um, but it has not proven yet to be the magical solution we, we hoped for. And I'll develop that in a moment. Um, a few words about the Council of Europe, which perhaps certainly those who are not from the European continent may be less familiar with. We are the oldest European organization. We bring together 47 member states. One of our founding fathers was Winston Churchill, but also Konrad Adenauer uh, from Germany uh, and others who after World War II decided to set up an organization uh, to ensure the protection of human rights, rule of law and democracy on the European continent. And this, uh, these are the three objectives we are working for. Um, we're very much a treaty based organization uh, and we produce treaties conventions. Uh, a well-known one is the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, but that applies only to the 47 member states of, of the Council of Europe and to our some 850 million citizens here in Europe. But we also have other conventions that deal with new technologies, and that brings me to the immediate link with the subject of today. We have a cybercrime convention, the only cybercrime convention in the world that at the moment has 70 state parties, also from nearly all continents, uh, and the Data Protection convention, convention that has 55 state parties, also from several continents, so going well beyond, beyond Europe. This to illustrate that the Council of Europe is not just working for a group of European states, but has set standards that have become really global, global benchmarks. Now, a word about uh, accountability, uh, the subject of today's, of today's talk. And I'll come back also to the current pandemic. Um, I would like to, to define here accountability as confronting people with the actions they take um, so that they cannot just do whatever. They will have to, at some point, confront the consequences and be faced with the consequences. And when we talk about artificial intelligence, uh, a quote comes to mind from Jurassic Park which I think many of you, if not every one of you, will have seen. It's actually the first, I think, the first Jurassic Park where this uh, film, where this quote comes from, where at some point uh, Jeff, Jeff Goldblum, uh, you know, the scientist in the film, says uh, when things go wrong that you scientists were so preoccupied what could be done that never any one of you asked the question what should be done. And that is perhaps also uh, something that relates to artificial intelligence. 
um, there are, despite the fact that uh, it has not found a cure uh, against COVID, it has, of course, a huge impact on our societies and will continue to have an even greater impact. Where governments tried to use it specifically uh, to fight the pandemic was by tracing apps, introducing proximity tracing apps. And what we have seen in most countries around the world is there has been remarkably little enthusiasm, remarkable little confidence of the public in these tracing apps. Um, so clear, clearly, as Amy also explained, there is a, there is a problem of, of trust. The issue of trust is very important. Now we can ask, is it uh, understandable or is it reasonable that people have this mistrust of technology and artificial intelligence being used by, by governments? Can things actually go wrong? And I think we can, we can all agree that things can indeed go wrong. Um, I think it was about last week that in the United States, uh, there were a series of reports about a, a wrongful arrest that was made on the basis of artificial intelligence. And not surprisingly, it was an Afro-American man uh, that was wrongly arrested because of a biased, uh, biased facial recognition system. And we know that facial recognition, uh, which relies very much, of course, on like all AI systems, on the data that are fed into it, um, re reproduces the bias in those data. Uh, and that is a problem that we have with facial recognition in AI. We also have that very much with judicial, the judicial use of AI in the judicial system, because uh, biases are, of course, reproduced. That is an example of things that can go wrong. Other things that can go wrong with automated decision making uh, are even more dramatic when we think, for instance, of the, uh, the Boeing 737 MAX. Uh, where apparently there was a problem with the automated decision making and the impossibility of a human override, the impossibility for humans to take over if the automatic system fails. Um, so it's quite understandable that, the, that there is um, a concern in the public about automated decision making and, of course, privacy, uh, the protection of data uh, comes into play here very much because uh, we know that massive amounts of data are being gathered on all of us because we use so many applications, because they're so very convenient. Uh, and of course, I'm one of them. Uh, but we also are, at least most of us are aware, that uh, we pay a price. There is no such thing as a free lunch and there is no such thing as a free application. We pay with our data. And we have a concern that this data can be abused, especially because the concentration of these data in the hands of just a very few, of very few companies uh, gives rise to, I think, understandable, understandable worries. Um, however, uh, regulating, by the way, this uh, just the protection of privacy may not even be enough. Uh, there was a very interesting article in the in the Guardian this week uh, pointing out that uh, the computing power of the companies that collect this data is now such that uh, they can actually respect individual privacy and still uh, come up with uh, AI and uh, with um, uh, suggestions or more than suggestions, uh, not only predicting uh, what will happen, but prescribing what will happen. And that is, of course, a real, uh, a real shift uh, that should give us uh, time to reflect, should make us pause, that we are moving from automated systems, uh, helping us take decisions, uh, predicting trends, to actually taking these decisions for us, uh, and also even prescribing what we should be doing, what we should be doing in future. The ethical frameworks are a very good basis, and uh, Amy has convincingly uh, demonstrated their, their importance. There are, at the moment, some 260 international ethical frameworks that have been collaborated in many cases uh, by governments and civil society and sometimes together with industry, so in a multi-stakeholder way. Um, they have one thing in common. They're not binding. You cannot take a company or a government to court on the basis of the violation of an ethical framework. And that is why in the Council of Europe uh, we have started work on 
the legal standards on artificial intelligence, taking, of course, the ethical frameworks as a basis because there are very good principles in there. Let me give you one example, the Montreal Declaration, for instance. Excellent, excellent principles. However, you cannot enforce them at present. So looking at these ethical principles, looking at existing legal standards, I already mentioned the Data Protection uh, Convention. I, uh, we have, the, as I said, the Cybercrime Convention. In Europe, we have the European Convention on Human Rights, which contains many principles that also uh, apply when governments delegate decision-making to machines. It's the governments that are responsible, whether they act through human agents or through mechanical or uh, technological agents. Um, but there are also new, there are also new concerns. Uh, we have areas uh, like, like medicine, for instance, uh, where uh, there are very strict standards and where no doubt uh, the many um, uh, applications of artificial intelligence will already be covered under the existing regulations. But when you think, for instance, of self-driving cars, uh, there we suddenly realize there is a gap because our existing regulations do not foresee automated, uh, automated driving and decisions taken by vehicles, which, as we have sadly found out, because there have been fatal accidents, can, can also pose a risk to human lives. And the more of these vehicles we'll have on our streets, of course, the greater the chances are that things will go wrong. So we're very much uh, convinced that we need to move uh, from just, not just, uh, that's the wrong word, certainly not, uh, that we move from very important ethical standards, stress, very important ethical standards, look at existing legal regulation, but move beyond that, move beyond and start uh, identifying in what areas uh, the design uh, and application of AI needs to be regulated. Like Amy, uh, I'm not talking about regulating a technology. We're of course not talking about regulating AI as such. And there are certain applications of AI where perhaps legal regulation uh, is not necessary, uh, where perhaps self-regulation of industry uh, can be sufficient. Thinking of music platforms uh, to which many of us subscribe whether one song, whether song A is suggested to you or song B uh, may not uh, directly and will not directly affect your human rights in all cases I can think of. So perhaps their self-regulation would be okay. But when we think about facial recognition, when you may be arrested uh, or, or worse because of uh, wrong, uh, uh, wrong analysis, faulty, biased uh, algorithms, then I think we really need to to ensure ensure your protection. So we're looking at these at these uh, principles at the moment in the Council of Europe. Uh, we have set up a special committee of national experts who work together with experts from industry and civil society, and not just our our European countries. We also have, uh, uh, for instance, United States, Canada, Japan, Mexico, and and other countries that are now applying to join. These, uh, these negotiations to examine the possibilities of such a free legal framework for those users of AI, uh, which directly affect uh, our human rights. Those applications and we need to look at, preferably uh, from the design phase already, uh, you know the term privacy by design, uh, also human rights by design, I would very much argue here, and of course their, their application and their implementation by governments. This is something that is now being being uh, being looked at. We hope before the end of the year to have a uh, to have an answer to as to whether it is possible to have uh, legal standards. I would personally very much uh, argue for binding legal standards, but our governments are still discussing this. Uh, and uh, should they come to an agreement as of yet next year, uh, we hope it would be possible to start negotiating negotiating a, a treaty that would give broad guidance. It would not be micro prescription. It would give broad guidance on the basis of which sector specific regulation could be developed. Now, some have argued that this would stifle innovation, but you may have, uh, and I'm sure many of you are aware of the position taken by many big companies in recent times, uh, all the very big ones, uh, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Microsofts, uh, of this world and many smaller ones who've argued in fact in favor of regulation because they are aware of the abuse that can be made of their technology 
um, and uh, they very much re uh, realize that good regulation uh, is uh, good for innovation, for responsible innovation and for trusted uh, AI, which of course is uh, what we are also working for. And uh, given the impact that AI will have on our societies, it is extremely important that we decide, and I'll conclude with this, that we decide very clearly what we want AI to do, how we want AI to do, what we delegate it to it, but also what we decide AI should not do. Thank you very much for your attention. Hey, Jan, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my conclusion is, your basic uh, conclusion is, there will, it's always going to be a human responsible at the end of the day. We cannot just leave it to the technology. Okay. Now, um, there are a number of questions we have seen in the chat already. Uh, actually, a question for both Jan and Amy is you have uh, indicated 260 frameworks uh, on ethics, uh, uh, over 130 on AI. And a couple of people have questions where they can get a list. So maybe uh, not right now or afterwards, you can share the links to uh, that information. And if I may, uh, Fritz, yeah, yeah. sorry, I can give an answer to that one straight away. An updated list has been made by an EU, a EU agency. So that's a partner organization. It's not the Council of Europe. It's an agency of the European Union based in Vienna which is called the FRA, the Fundamental Rights Agency. And they have published a uh, very, they have uh, recently published a list of all the ethical frameworks that exist. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. And then maybe just to be clear about, so I had a, a smaller number, 130, uh, I think it's rising now. That was AI ethics principles. So not necessarily frameworks, but different organizations establishing. And that was from a, a Harvard group working on that, but I can send that okay. later. But that, that's the question, at least, that you can point people to where they can find the resources. Okay. Hey, again, both thank you for the presentation, and I'm glad you're all now uh, online. I also want to introduce now Arthur um, van der Wees, who will moderate this part of the discussion. So in the next 30 to 40 minutes, we will hope to cover as much of the questions and the feedback from the, the audience as possible. So Arthur, I'm going to hand it over to you, and also thank you very much for being here. Uh, thanks, Fritz, and uh, welcome everybody to the uh, Q and A. Um, I will. Uh, I have followed the um, the Q and A um, here uh, in this session. Currently, twenty one uh, questions. Uh, uh, several are uh, linked to the other. Uh, I think a couple I can um, answer myself in an inter. Let's say introduction towards a question, and then Amy Young can uh, both uh, try to give input on the question as well as perhaps. Uh, reflect on, uh, on, on that as well. I would like to start with indeed the pandemic because uh, once again, nature has presented us with a daunting challenge, which is global. Uh, and of course we have seen a lot of local and national interventions. Uh, to what extent do you think, uh, you know, AI we're here in a global context here in this call and the AI for good, what, what, uh, what kind of way do you think AI could help out uh, either perhaps not today, but uh, perhaps next week or uh, next year, because we will, of course, uh, continue to see, unfortunately, new waves coming up uh, on, the, on this current pan, uh, pan, uh, pandemic. So perhaps, Amy, can you start? Jan, can you start, please? Okay. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we have seen uh, uh, great skepticism as regards contact tracing apps, uh, which were presented in, in a way also by the media, I must say, as the sort of a possible, as, as, as a remedy, uh, as a major remedy to, to contagion. Uh, what the media have under, uh, strangely, and that is also part of this, of this, this should be part, I think, of this discussion, what has been very much underrepresented is the uh, a very uh, good use of AI in predicting particular outbreaks in, in certain areas, uh, which is available. And as I mentioned before, in sharing data, uh, if so much progress has already been made on, uh, on vaccines and on treatment uh, in identifying what works, but also of course what doesn't work, that has to do with clinical trials, of course, because ultimately 
you cannot replace uh, testing on humans uh, to ascertain whether something is really effective, but to decide which molecules to test and how to put them together. Their AI has played a major role in making it at the moment possible for scientists all over the world within seconds to find out the results of their colleagues on other continents. And it is this particular use of AI in, in, in sharing data, in, in, in identifying uh, what works, that, uh, and which goes very much underreported, I must say, uh, that also for future pandemics, and we've already, already been uh, warned that uh, swine flu may next be the next thing that hits us. But there, on all these issues, it is AI that helps to, to, to uh, get the right information to the right people quickly. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Amy? Uh, Amy missed the question because of a technical hip up. Maybe you can. Ah, okay, all right, that's fine. So, Amy, um, uh, the uh, follow up question on, um, on Jan. We just talked uh, briefly about the pandemic and how AI can, data can, uh, can help for good, uh, as it's a global. Uh, challenge and not uh, even though it's been picked up and taken care of so far quite locally. Um, but perhaps we can add the uh, social, the sustainable development goals, the SDGs to that. You know, we have 70, we have 17 um, to play with and we have 169 targets uh, that are related to those. Um, so, uh, and as we're here in AI for good, uh, how can uh, AI help out uh, with, you know, this um, uh, very important, uh, these very important targets? That are some are doing quite well, some are having, and, and others are lacking a bit. Thank you. Uh, sorry for my my poor connection. If if I start to freeze, please give me a, a signal somehow. Um, so first, if I could also build on what what Jan was saying about the benefits, you know, that we can achieve through AI in this current pandemic. I think what's also important and an, another concept that we can draw from the ethics of technology is a way of understanding the technology when it's introduced into society. So I think it's really important that uh, industry, that consumers, that citizens know that when we're using something like an app to, to track and trace individuals um, as a way of preventing the spread, of course, that's a, a noble goal, but at the same time, it's an experiment. Right? We, we don't know exactly what the positive outcomes will be, what the negative outcomes will be on the short term and the long term. And I think it's time now that we start to be very transparent and clear about the fact that when AI is used in society, we have very little operational experience with it and we need to start framing it as an experiment. And the reason why that is so important is because once we make it an explicit experiment, then we also need to put safeguards in place. We need to make sure that the people that are uh, subjects in this experiment are protected. So I just wanted to say that, uh, that quick follow-up. But when we're talking about artificial intelligence to achieve the SDGs, um, the, the second question that you had asked me, I think you know we are seeing some progress uh, in in a variety of different spaces, whether it's healthcare, uh, whether it's uh, raising people up out of poverty, whether it's energy consumption, and how we can understand uh, where we we can actually start to create more sustainable infrastructures in in organizations. Uh, again, though, what I said in my talk, I think it's really important for us to recognize this distinction between AI for the SDGs and sustainable AI, that we need to start looking at sustainable AI as the, the precursor, the, the necessary requirement before we even get into AI for the SDGs. And that means making sure that uh, there's an assessment on minimizing computational power required for training, that we have companies who are explicitly looking into reusable data sources and so on and so forth. Thank you, Amy. So uh, I would like to uh, also, because I saw a couple of questions related to it, um, to ask Jan on, um, uh, on the, uh, <clears throat> what he sees or what he would envision on who could be in the same in, impartial independent party or agency uh, that could help out in you know, the, um, measuring the explainability and the accountability of AI. Of course, the, uh, as, as um, Amy mentioned, the organization uh, that is deploying it, including the data they're using, of course, are primarily you know, accountable or co-accountable. But how can we you now as society uh, also have some trust 
uh, that that can be uh, verified in some kind of way. And, and any thoughts on that? Yes, thank you, thank you very much for for that question. Uh, that brings me to the to the question of certification, which is something we are looking at in the framework of the the legal answers we're looking for whether uh, we should not also for the specific AI that poses risks that I mentioned, and not for all AI once again, but for AI that poses risk, whether we should not certify. Um, let me give you two examples. Uh, an, an NGO, which is called uh, Algorithm uh, Watch, uh, went to have a look at algorithms used by a federal job agency in a European country. It is a job agency that is responsible for actually, it, it's the national job agency. So people who are unemployed uh, try to go there and try to find an, a job. And it's the duty of that of that agency to transmit offers from to, to those people who are looking for jobs. Uh, and it turns out uh, much of that has been automated and is in fact done by, by algorithms, algorithms and AI. So therefore through AI. Now, interesting enough, what the uh, what Algorithm Watch found in this country was that um, uh, disabled people and single mothers were not getting any job offers, and it examined the algorith algorithms and it found this was the fault of the faulty programming. It was not the result of the data; it was the algorithms themselves that were tweaked in such a way that if you were a single mother or a disabled person you would not get any job offers. Uh, so a clear case of discrimination uh, in the algorithms itself, not in the data. Many of us are aware of biased data, but here we're actually speaking about biased algorithms. Uh, and uh, of course, that should give us a great cause for concern. It also teaches us something. It teaches us that if an NGO can establish this, can ascertain this, it should certainly be also possible for uh, an independent agency to do so. So one of the possibilities we will be looking at is to see whether, as for medicine, uh, which is also certified, and in fact, uh, within the Council of Europe, we are responsible for the European Pharmacopoeia, uh, which, uh, which has a major role in this, whether it would be possible to set up an international agency that would uh, actually certify particular uses of, of, of uh, AI in, in risk areas. That can be done through a central body established in a member state, like an agency, for instance, like the Pharmacopeia we have here, could also be a network of national institutions, but working with the same standards. Uh, and I'm giving this particular example of medicine, because some pushback one hears is that yes, but companies would never want to share those, uh, this information with you because of their business model, of course, depends on it, and their profits depend on it. But that's also true for medicine. And of course, the agencies that, that evaluate uh, the medicine and that certify their conformity will not share the formula with the competitors. And that of course would then also apply to the algorithms. So I think it is, it is, very, it is very important that we look at this question of certification because I think it's essential for trust. It's actually also an indication of what is still so much, what is still lacking in the digital world. Um, the microphones we are using, even the chairs we sit on during this webinar uh, have to meet all sorts of certifications. But most of the applications we use in our daily lives on our smartphones and our other uh, devices, and which have a much bigger impact on our lives than the chairs we sit on, are not subject to any certification. Yeah, absolutely, John. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm not sure whether Amy is still uh, uh, there, but I can't yeah, see I'm her. Here. Are I'm you here. good? Good, good. Yeah, okay. I just turned yeah. off my camera. For so, so, Amy, uh, we got a couple of questions which uh, I, I recognize as well. You know, we talk about accountability, we talk about ethics, and these are, well, especially accountability is sort of a new term um, uh, that is going around. You know, I'm being a lawyer, uh, you know, I'm used to it, but normally, of course, we talk about responsibility, and then, uh, you know, if things go wrong, or really wrong, liability, uh, and of course, you want to avoid that. Um, but there were some questions on, you know, uh, whether human rights are a part of, of, of ethics, uh, and, um, and, and, yeah, what kind of whether it's built, uh, whether it differs per country or continent or religion, uh, perhaps it's, it is good. Uh, what, what do you think? You know, uh, we talk about AI, uh, the definition. Um, these are generally very broad. Accountability is quite broad, and, and ethics as, as well. How can we, you know, shed some light on, on that instead of having to read 130 
uh, guidelines. You don't want to read 130 guidelines? I would love to read. I, I actually read, read uh, quite a few of them, yes. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure. So I think um, that's a great question, one that I, I do hear uh, coming up quite a bit. I think it's important for me to also clarify what I mean when I say to use ethics as a resource or to have an ethicist who is on a design team. I'm not saying that the ethicist is the one who has all of the right answers, that the ethicist is the one to say, yes, do this, no, do, do not do that. Um, I am, I'm instead saying that uh, the ethicist is meant to stimulate a, a kind of thinking a kind of reflection on, yes, how, how do we understand if this technology is doing something good or doing something bad? And that collectively, the team or the company or the organization decides this is the direction that we want to go in. But attached to that, I, mean, I of course, I agree with Jan Kleissen about having regulation, especially when we're talking about high risk AI applications. Um, but, but attached to that, it's also, uh, transparency is important. So I think what we also need to do is to require organizations to go through this kind of reflective process, to be transparent about it, that yes, they chose this data or they validated the model in this way. They uh, are using it for this application because of this principle, of that principle. And that's when we can really start to have a large scale conversation about uh, aligning uh, ethics between between cities, between cultures, and whatnot. But right now, it's it's too uh, it, it's it's not um, helpful to say that um, uh, we we can't do anything with ethics because we have to choose whose ethics is it, and so on and so forth. We need to start the process of using ethics to be critical of the technology, to have companies be transparent about that, and that's when we can really have an engaged conversation, knowing what's going on within the company. So, uh, Amy, follow-up question on that for you. It was also asked in the uh, in the Q and A. Um, you know, how can you deploy that? And I know you have done that uh, before in real life. Uh, deploy that by design in ethical specifications. Now, how can you know you we help out that it's not only the engineers and the, and the architects uh, making a, a a functional specification, but that the non -fun 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 functionals like you know the, the things you mentioned including privacy and security, and even the SDGs and everything could be in incorporated. Yeah. And that, that, by the way, there's also a question on whether there are some, some uh, nice examples about that. Right, okay. So um, in my, when I'm wearing my academic hat, I, do, I publish on the topic of ethicists as designer and including an ethicist as a part of the design team. And so I've done that at um, uh, Center for Telematics and Information Technology. I've done that as an institute where I am there to help the computer scientists um, you know, understand, am I, I'm legally allowed to scrape from this source, but I, I don't know if, if I really should do that. So help them also working through these, these questions. Um, I'm also uh, right now on a team where I'm the ethicist when we're designing a social robot or a robot that's meant for human robot interaction. And my job is meant to almost be a kind of hacker that I, I sit at the table and I say, all right, let's think what can go wrong? What could possibly go wrong if we ask for this uh, data point, if we uh, have the robot speak in a certain way? So my, my role is to almost hack the design process, if you will. Um, but I, I do this in uh, other contexts as well. I'll stop my video again because I'm not sure how my connection is. Uh, I do this as, a, as an individual within the Deloitte infrastructure. And so again, I am there to speak with clients who are interested in uh, doing something about data ethics, about digital ethics. And my job is to be in the room to say, you know, what could go wrong? Uh, what kind of policies could you create? And so on and so forth. We use digital ethics canvases and that kind of thing. And another way that I'm involved with this kind of inclusion of ethics in the design process is uh, I'm co-founder, co-director of a not-for-profit organization called the Foundation for Responsible Robotics. And we are developing a quality mark, which Arthur, you're also involved in this project. We're developing a quality mark to try and not necessarily provide certification, but to try and provide an assurance to consumers who will buy a robot product that this product has gone through a very rigorous process of uh, an internal audit, if you will. So looking at principles like sustainability, 
fairness, privacy, and then we speak to the company about all of the design decisions that are made. Uh, do they have documentation to show that they have thought about these issues? What are they doing about these issues? And in that way, we're trying to get closer to bringing ethics into the actual design process of an AI-driven robot and to be able to signal to notify consumers that the company has has taken an extra step, has done something more to achieve uh, ethics embedded in their design. Thank you very much, Amy. So uh, to uh, to you, uh, Jan, on on the same topic, uh, you know, what kind of tooling could we think of, or are you perhaps thinking of, on on helping out in uh, verifying? So we can of course do it with more paper. You know, all the guidelines probably are written in a language. Uh, human readable, uh, but why not uh, start doing more enforcement and verification uh, on the same in the same means that you know you uh, you, you have to encounter, which is AI uh, on on that end, or at least something digital. Do you see any developments there? Well, to to perhaps uh, come back what I said earlier about the certification, the idea is not very much just to shift paper on this. Uh, I'm sure Algorithm Watch, when it in the example I gave, and by by the way, they gave, did another one very recently uh, on Instagram, uh, which was much much published, uh, which actually drew uh, a few interesting uh, conclusions about uh, gender equality and uh, and bare skin on 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 Instagram. Uh, but they had programmers looking at that. So for me, the certification would be done by by uh, by experts. Uh, by programmers, computer scientists, whatever, uh, engineers, and uh, not by, by simple lawyers like myself, but really people who can dissect the algorithms and can actually uh, identify, as Algorithm Watch did, identify uh, the, the flaws and the discrimination inherent in the, in the program. And a follow-up question, Jan, thanks for that. A follow-up question for you. Uh, there was a question in the chat uh, on uh, the Council of Europe's uh, in, uh, Convention on Privacy. There was a question on what the, um, the differences are with the GDPR. I think we don't have time for that, uh, but perhaps you can give some high-level uh, uh, response. Um, and then my, my question is, uh, do we need personal identifiable information, so personal data, uh, for you know, to do proper AI? Or can we say, you know, by default, we should not have or use any uh, personal data? What are your thoughts on that? Very quick question, a very quick reply, sorry, to the question on the GDPR and the Council of Europe's Convention. The Council of Europe's Convention is the mother uh, of the GDPR. Uh, the convention is much older, it's called Convention 108. Uh, then came the European Union with the GDPR, and as a result, we have modernized our convention now uh, to bring it in line with GDPR and go even further. Uh, and uh, the European Union will now also become a party to this new convention. So we are um, uh, going upwards uh, together, if you like, moving forward, moving uh, forward uh, together on, on this one. Um, and the second question, sorry, if you can just... The, the second question is, you know, principle number one uh, could be, and I'm just uh, raising it, uh, uh, no personal data by default ah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about AI systems. Yeah, yeah, that is that is of course uh, that is an interesting option. And for instance, on the tracing apps, uh, you know, that is what many countries decided, uh, and uh, because they thought they thought authorities thought that, and, and rightly judged that uh, giving too much uh, sharing too much personal data and centralizing them would discourage the public from using this tracing anti-COVID uh, uh, contagion apps. But nonetheless, uh, the, the citizen wasn't convinced. And, um, and again, to refer to the article in, in, in The Guardian, uh, it was uh, there it was quite convincingly pointed out that uh, even if we protect our private data uh, so that you and I cannot be identified immediately and that the information we have on our devices actually stays there, uh, the, uh, the AI and the sheer computing power of industry now makes it possible nonetheless to uh, identify uh, trends and then micro target us. So protecting privacy is extremely important, but it's not going to be enough. <laughs> yeah, Amy, your thoughts? On whether or not we should... Uh... Yeah, well, well, well we, um, to what extent, if you know, we need to use or should use PII or not, uh, personal data, and indeed, as Jan mentioned, could be that you're not having it as input 
but then even still the output could be personal data. So on that side, you need to have something accountable as well. So right. it, it's not yeah. indeed uh, only input and output. It, it, that is not how this world yeah. works now uh, now yeah. nowadays. And I think so. I I guess to to hack again, I would ask why are we not using the personally identifiable information? And is that to protect anonymity? But then I would push back and say, uh, can can we actually protect anonymity? Because as Jan rightly pointed out, even if we don't use personal information, it's still possible when you combine different data sources, uh, when you look at the kinds of predictions that you can make with uh, using machine learning algorithms, then I would ask, is, is that even possible or is there another alternative that we could be looking at? So on that, any thoughts on how to avoid dual use? You know, the, the in, uh, either intended or unintended, because we have seen and heard and the, inter, the, the introduction was as well, uh, that, you know, the engineers are enthusiastic, they, they love to uh, code, uh, and then later on they need to call me because they, they, they get sued. Uh, and I, I don't want them to call me, I, I want to help them out upstream. So how, how do we avoid dual use? I'm not talking in the military context, just in a general context, for good or for ill, you know, that, that's already a difficult context. concept. If I, if I may kick off there. I would I would go back to I would co go back to Jurassic Park and I think it really, <laughs> okay. yeah, but it's it's really quite it, it it really does apply I think to artificial intelligence and I mean obviously uh, the decoders the people who are enthusiastic they're thinking all the time of what the system can do it can do this it can do that uh, but does that mean that we should do it perhaps they should what should we do should really be much more carefully assessed and of course. AI can do all sorts of things, but should it do all sorts of things? Um, there should, I think, be red lines. Uh, by the way, the Council of Europe uh, also pioneered red lines when it comes to technology. Many of you will remember when the sheep Dolly was cloned. Uh, within two years afterwards, we established uh, a legal instrument uh, prohibiting human cloning. Uh, why? Not because human cloning couldn't be done. It could very well be done. Sheep Dolly had just proven that it was very likely to be possible, but it shouldn't be done. So I think that sort of consideration should be very much uh, on the top of our minds. Absolutely. So if, I can, if I can build on that, what, what Jan is also putting on the table here, this is very, very much what we discuss in ethics, right? It's, it's very much a cornerstone making this distinction between, yes, you can do it, but should you do it? So it's, it's not just about having ethics guidelines and principles and practices in place, but it's also about providing education or awareness to the people within an organization. Give them the space to be able to ask these questions, to be able to think about what are their red lines and, and do they disagree with the company that they're working for because they've been asked to do something. So we also need to start thinking about ethics as a tool, not only in the creation of technology, but as a resource for the people who are involved in the making of the technology. Give them the tools to be able to critically reflect. And I mean, we see that in the Netherlands that uh, now it's mandatory. If you're in computer sciences, if you're in any technical studies uh, going through university, you have to take at least one ethics course. So we're trying to embrace this idea that, yes, it's wonderful for students to have the, the technical skills and the know-how, but they also need to be equipped with the ability to critically reflect. And that's, I mean, that's also something that humans do and the AI can't do, right? So we should, you know, be proud of the, the skills that we have and hone them and, and, and really appreciate them for what they provide. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Jan, you wanted to... Uh... No, I think that's, I agree. Yeah, fine, okay. So, so uh, Jurassic Park, who would have thought? I, that's uh, something, I think it, it makes sense to um, you know, um, convey the message that also Amy just said on how do we make sure that they understand instead of that we are lecturing or, or as a lawyer, you know, and try to uh, explain uh, or convince people. I stopped, I stopped convincing people. I try to make sure that they understand themselves. Um, and one of the things will be that they will need to uh, um, look into to the Jurassic Park movie. I think that's a very good one. Uh, also, perhaps, you know, in cybersecurity, we nowadays have cyber ranges, uh, you know, where you can, uh, can do in a virtual uh, non-productive environment and see what can go possibly go wrong. Uh, perhaps we need to think about, you know, AI ranges uh, where we can do the same things and uh, have fun uh, and see where we can have the most impact uh, for good. Um, Another one that I have for you 
is uh, if you know if anybody. So this was for the audience. If anybody asks you uh, or uh, you know what else can we do with this data, then probably this is not allowed uh, <laughs> by law or ethically. Um, so that is one that you would uh, want to avoid. And indeed, um, I think Amy talked about scraping. That's also a term that that, that raises a flag. It may not be red, but it's definitely a flag. Um, so there we, we can also, um, from our human intelligence side, already identify when things may go wrong uh, and then try to uh, uh, either successfully or not at, at least attempt to help out. Um, so um, uh, Amy already mentioned you need to have an ethicist uh, in, uh, in a team to develop. Uh, and then, of course, as you mentioned, uh, Amy, is not about all, all, only the upstream, but also the midstream where you start converging you know, AI systems and, and, and components and, and data points. Uh, and then of course, all the way down uh, the, the use and the hopefully positive impact um, on the life cycle. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the, my point is the following, or my question is the following, you know, we do have driving, driver licenses. And uh, I know the Council of Europe is helping out with my green card in Europe that I can drive in countries that I, uh, I, I've, I've not even contacted with before, but I'm allowed to drive there. But um, how, how do you, what, what are your thoughts on a, a not a drive, um, a first license, but a driving license? So a license of the car, which of course uh, includes hundreds of components, probably also a lot of sensors and radio equipment. Um, and yeah, uh, because you will be enjoying at the back seat um, a, a, a nice drive to either vacation or business or family. I think perhaps we should, I'd like to take you up actually on the driving license of, of the person, because uh, uh, it brings me to a very important point, which so far we haven't touched upon, and that is uh, AI literacy. Uh, AI is already shaping the lives of most of us in more ways than we could actually imagine. I think even if we now, all the participants to this webinar would list 10 uh, issues on which AI is already influencing their lives, I bet that all of us would at least forget 10 other ones where it's also happening and which we didn't think of in the first place. So it's already shaping us, uh, our lives. I think this is certainly an informed audience. But if you go uh, to speak to the people in the street, how many people would actually be aware of how AI is shaping their, their lives and what they can do about it? There's also a huge digital divide. Um, the digital divide is something that has been often referred to when we speak about uh, the, the global south and, and uh, the, develop, the richer world, if you like. Uh, but it also exists very much in, 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 in affluent societies. One of the criticisms of these uh, contract, uh, contact tracing apps to fight the pandemic, for instance, in the country I live in, which is France, but it's, the example is from France, but it would apply to many, many other uh, highly industrialized countries, is that about a quarter of the French people do not have a smartphone. They may have a form of mobile phone, but they don't have a smartphone and they would not able, be able to use an application. Uh, and this is also generational. Uh, a lot of the more vulnerable people uh, to COVID-19 are those that do not have, do not master the digital technology. So uh, I think your example of a driving license, uh, I mean, the car will be checked and I think the certifications that I mentioned could be part of that. But for the people that actually use AI or are subjected to AI, I think it's extremely important that they are taught uh, what they're dealing with. They don't have to be able to program, but they should be told you are now dealing with artificial intelligence. In this case, the California law that obliges companies, uh, which have more than I think now a million customers is the current uh, threshold, uh, but I think that may be moving, uh, requires that these companies inform their customers that they are actually dealing with an automated system and not with human beings. And that should certainly, to my mind, be also part of our legal framework, an obligation on governments, that when governments delegate uh, authority to machines, that the citizen is told that he or she is dealing with a machine and A and B, that there must be always, as it's pointed out in the various data protection text, when it comes to data protection, that also in other issues, there must be the possibility of the famous human in control, the human override. There must be appeal, an appeal possible to a human decision maker. Yeah, thank you, Jan. If I, if I could just add something to that, Arthur. Um, so I, 
completely, I, I agree with Jan. I think another interesting concept to think about is de-skilling. So the idea of, you know, when, when we delegate something to the machine, we no longer will be practicing that. So we will no longer acquire the skills that are necessary. So at a certain moment in time, you can imagine that if we uh, continue to delegate to systems to, um, yeah, maybe even to drive, then we will, you know, after generations have individuals who no longer know how to drive. And, and maybe that's not necessarily a fundamental skill that we must hang on to, but if it is, you know, um, thinking about what is fair, what is reasonable, or if you're uh, in the, an airplane situation, right, and you have uh, planes that are basically flying themselves, and then what does a pilot do when something goes wrong? Because if, if they're used to the plane handling it, then, then what happens with the, when the human has to take over? but they don't have the skills of practicing the takeover. So we could see that in, in medical applications, if, if you know, AI systems are, are making calls on um, analyzing, data, uh, analyzing data, analyzing images and, and things like that. So I, I just wanted to add to Jan's, it's, it's absolutely upskilling, reskilling literacy of what the technology is capable of and what its limitations are. But we should also have, you know, take a step back to think about what skills do we want to maintain as a society? Right? We want to continue to be social people. So that means we have to make sure that AI doesn't take in, uh, step in and take over social roles. We want humans to continue to develop those skills. And if, I may, yeah. if, I, may, sorry, if I may, I just uh, add to what Amy says, because I, this is a very interesting point. Um, it, if I may, it is not only, uh, we very much agree with her, uh, but it also, it goes even further. Um, what about our democratic skills? Uh, because the more we, we delegate, the more we delegate and the more we trust machines, uh, the less we will be making informed choices ourselves. And that will have a huge impact on our societies. Already now, there are applications in many countries that help the, uh, the voter to make up uh, her or his choice. Uh, that you answer a questionnaire online and the machine will say, well, you should vote for this party. Uh, and in a few years time, perhaps we will not even fill in the questionnaire anymore. And the machine will just tell us who to vote for. And we'll lose our ability to critically assess uh, what our decision makers are putting before us. And that will have a massive impact on our society. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think we also established that it's not only about uh, certification of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the data or the, the algorithms or the ecosystem, or even, you know, a whole platform like a car or a plane for that matter, but also actually the persons, either engineer or all the way down. I think that's very good. It's, it's a personal, uh, we, we keep nicely personal. On the personal level, I would like to ask you one, one more question. Uh, I think I covered most of the uh, questions in the chat box uh, to some extent. Um, but one is that, you know, uh, um, you know when we talk about personal, um, I, you know, we have um, the, the great capability, the biggest capability that we have here, both here in this chat, but also globally, is more than 7 billion people with supercomputers between their ears. Um, so how can we, you know, we are poorly organized. We're poorly, uh, poorly organized ourselves. And therefore, sometimes we are either happy or not that certain uh, corporates or uh, others are walking away with, uh, with knowledge. But uh, how can we, uh, what would be your thoughts to try to uh, set up a movement on, let's say, citizen engaged public uh, uh, good? Um, because again, the supercomputer is between the ear. You don't need to have gone to, uh, to, uh, to university. You don't need a mobile uh, phone for that. Uh, but we're not yet organized well. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, we were speaking also about the sustainable development goals here. I think education, I think the, the, this comes back to AI literacy, but goes far beyond it. It's, 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 it's education, of course, you're quite right about the supercomputer uh, between the ears, but uh, that's the human brain. Uh, but uh, if children in so many countries do not get even a basic uh, education, uh, not only will they won't even reach the digital gap because they'll be left out before. So for me, therefore, education and their companies and, of course, AI and applications can, can, be, can be of tremendous, tremendous help uh, if the political will is there to, make, to ensure that everyone can benefit from it. 
There's a big movement now that everyone should get a free vaccine against COVID-19. I think we should join to that to make sure that everyone also has access to the technology that will shape their future. Thank you, Jan. Amy? Um, I would, I of course agree with Jan, and then I would add on to that educational component. Yes, understand uh, what AI is capable of, how it's being applied, but again, uh, starting to to teach people to be critical. So, so to teach people to to second guess it, to um, think about what it looks like when you trust the techno technology too much, how far that can actually go. So I agree with the component of education, but I would almost say a different kind of literacy. Uh, in addition to literacy about the, the technology, how it's made and what it's capable of, start empowering people to ask questions because when they start to ask questions, then companies actually you know, perk up their ears and think, oh, 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 right. Okay. So you're asking me this question. I guess I should probably tell you what data I have about you. I, I guess I should think twice before I share this data. So I, I think it's a, an addition to literacy, but it's a different kind of, of literacy. Right. So um, Jan, Amy, uh, I would like to um, ask you one more question on uh, some final thoughts or summary or, or recommendations or shout outs, call to actions. Anything goes, it's up to you. The floor is yours. Take your time. So can I, of course, give the floor first to Amy? Perhaps first Jan, because Amy, you're mute. Perhaps you need to uh, get the camera off. Jan, go ahead. Okay, well, um, perhaps to, to, to come back to what I said earlier in the presentation. Um, it is absolutely vital that we, based on ethical standards, uh, but move to to uh, reg to buy, to legally binding regulation, at least for the critical and uh, AI applications, uh, the abuse of which can be extremely dangerous, can threaten our lives, uh, threaten our societies, can threaten our freedoms. That's the first. Secondly, uh, close international cooperation on this, uh, which we have seen, uh, to my mind, insufficiently in in the COVID in the COVID area. And thirdly, doing it together with doing this together very much with civil society, of course, with industry, which has to be on board. Uh, and uh, perhaps finally, to do it fast. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, and I guess in, in closing, I would say, you know, I of course agree with everything that, that Jan has put on the table, but I also think it's important for us to recognize that we can't stop with the ethics. So even once we have regulation, which we will in Europe have regulation for AI, but even once that happens, we need to recognize that the, the nature of the ethical issues, their prioritization, they will change with time. As we understand more about the technology, the, the issues and the risks will change. And so we need to have this kind of ethical, critical reflection accompany the development and the deployment of the technology so that we can have this kind of feedback loop with, with policymakers and, and with regulators. So I think um, I, I hear a lot that it's, you know, uh, ethics or regulation, and we, we have to stop that way of thinking. And it needs to be, we need both of them working together um, in, a, in a collaborative manner. And that goes for human rights as well. So when I was discussing ethics, of course, I, I talked about values and the language of values, but human rights are a cornerstone of ethics. So absolutely, that, that becomes a part, a central feature of the conversation. And then in my last point is, um, to remember or, or to start to conceptualize that when any technology is first introduced into society, and especially with artificial intelligence, we need to understand that this is an experiment. This is a social experiment and we must put safeguards in place. And some of those safeguards in place will be policy and regulation to prevent risks to hu fundamental human rights. And some of those safeguards will be ethical technology assessments, making sure that companies are thinking about what could possibly go wrong, even if it's on a minimal scale, so that we start to yeah, learn more about this experiment that we're all involved in. Thanks, Amy. Uh, again, thank you very much for your passionate uh, response and uh, contribution. I really love it. And Jan, as well, for you, uh, I really like your input as well. Um, so I made a lot of notes. Uh, I, I learned a lot as well. Um, 
And um, again, thank you. And I'll now give it back to, uh, to Fritz as the uh, main moderator. You're mute, Fritz. My apologies. I want to thank Jan, uh, Arthur, and Amy for this lively discussion. And also want to uh, thank all the delegates for all the interaction and the questions. Uh, we haven't been able to uh, cover everything uh, completely, but the gist we did. So in the chat, I will uh, put the email and the address of the Institute for Accountability in the Digital Age. So if anybody has uh, a question or some feedback input, please share and we'll do our best to uh, make sure that that information gets spread. Um, finally, some final thoughts from my side uh, to give with you. Again, I want to thank the ITU for this opportunity. Uh, as said in introduction, we want to act as a catalyst for this discussion on accountability in the digital age. So that's what we've done today. Uh, we will continue this discussion after the summer uh, when we'll uh, produce a report on the, 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 summer, the summit we had in The Hague uh, last year. And we hope to have a webinar presenting the findings of the report and some key observations. So I wanna thank again, everybody for this opportunity and hand it back to uh, Jane Um of the ITU, which will close the session. So, oh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Fritz. So what an insightful and intense discussion. A big thanks to our panelists, as well as to all the participants for making it so engaging. And before we wrap up, I'd like to highlight a few things that may be of interest. So tomorrow we have a session on channel estimation, uh, machine learning applied to the physical layer of a millimeter wave, MIMO. And next Tuesday on 7th of July, there's a webinar on artificial intelligence in aviation. And on Thursday, which is 9th of July, we have a prepared a keynote session on new ways of thinking of the mobile phone for healthcare and the current pandemic. So we are pasting the links for the registrations in the chat. And you can also find this information as well as lots of other information and background material on aiforgood.itu.int. So with that, I'd like to close today's webinar. And once again, like to thank everyone involved, our panel, our participants, our partner sponsors and the co convener Switzerland. Thank you very much. And hope to see you again at the next webinar. Stay safe and healthy. Bye-bye.